good soup. Good soup. I said I'll be doing three Devoid Logic videos on season six, but I think it'll be better if I do just two and condense the rest of the season into this video. And I'll do away with episode introductions so I can move through the season faster. On their way to negotiate with the masters, Tyrion says a very cringy line to Missande. My own recent experience with slavery has taught me the horrors of that institution. How many days we were slave? Long enough to know. Not long enough to understand. This is probably one of the most disrespectful and tasteless things Tyrion has said, despite maybe when he asked his brother what Brienne's cooch was like. But the blatant disregard of Missandei's past horrors, and Tyrion trying to relate to it, is disgusting. You can even see Grey Worm exuding a great deal of anger from that statement in the background. Melt it down and add it to the others for Tyrion's terrible development of character traits after David and Dan started writing him. Getting to the meat of the scene though, Tyrion offers the Masters a seven year plan to phase out slavery in their economy. And that seems overly generous considering that they almost killed Daenerys, burned down their fleet, killed Ser Barrison, and numerous other guards. At this point, they should be pretty hostile towards the Masters given that they have no interest in getting rid of slavery. Because, as they said, it's basically their tradition. We still lived in chains. As they have since the dawn of time. Slavery is the way of our world. So, Tyrion expects the Masters to change on good faith, and doesn't say how he'll enforce the monetary policies he pitched. So, what's the point to change then? They practically have no incentive, and it would be more of a hassle to phase out slavery for them. It's also pretty silly that the Masters want Daenerys to leave, while simultaneously destroying her fleet. It seems like David and Dan kind of forgot about the motivations of the Masters while deleting Danny's fleet for the Greyjoy Alliance. While on the subject of dumb plans, Daenerys comes up with an idea to overcome the cow and his blood riders. And by overcome, I mean she just knocks down a couple of fire stands, which somehow sets the entire building on fire. When the floor is composed of dirt and stone, I don't know how the fire was able to spread so quickly. The only explanation I can think of is Daenerys coming in and dumping gasoline everywhere before the encounter. Because within 15 seconds of Danny knocking down the first fire stand, the roof is already falling down and burning. And whenever she knocks down a fire stand, the fire shoots out like a heat-seeking missile running after the Dothraki. So along with the fire acting in a completely unnatural manner, the scene is also rapidly edited to make the fire seem like it's spreading with lightning speed. And on top of all that fire nonsense, the Dothraki just cower in fear from Daenerys instead of stopping her from knocking down more fire stands. Like after the first one, they could have easily walked around the fire and grabbed her. But nope, let's just run for the door like pussies. The most brave and badass people in the entire world of Game of Thrones are immediately turned into incompetent babies so that Daenerys could easily overcome them. Arya is awarded with her second chance and is given an assignment to kill an actress. When looking into her target, she ends up watching an entire play. This play isn't really essential to the plot by any means, but it is interesting to see the public view of the events of King's Landing and to see Arya's reaction. So one play scene is alright, but two play scenes since there is one in episode 8 I think is pushing it. It comes across as David and Dan putting in these filler scenes to get past the 50 minute mark in episodes. And this is kind of a common trend now because I pointed out two other filler scenes within the first three episodes. Getting back to Arya though, her whole situation with the Faceless Assassins feels contrived because she's already on her second chance, and at every turn she is showing hesitation like asking Jacken a bunch of shady questions when it comes to her target. Who wants her dead? That does not matter. The younger actress. She's jealous because Lady Crane is better. She seems like a decent woman. That alone is a massive red flag, and it seems like all she needs to do to seem like a faceless assassin is to refer to herself in the third person. Unless if Jacken knows she's clearly bullshitting and secretly admires her, but later on he sends the wave to go and kill her, so that wouldn't make sense. I mean, may as well just get into that whole fiasco now to get it over with, because holy plot armor, man. This is the first instance in the show where it is absolutely unbelievable as to how a character survived. She gets stabbed multiple times in the gut, swims through a dirty river that should infect her wounds, and then wanders through Bravos for god knows how long while profusely bleeding everywhere, and ends up making it all the way to the play to find the actress. And how convenient that she also knows how to stitch her wounds. And it doesn't even stop there because the Waif finds Arya half a day later, and Arya is somehow running around and doing parkour like there aren't five holes in her stomach. It would make much more sense to opt for minor injuries like slashes instead of stab wounds, or just cutting out the chase scene altogether because it comes across as comical. 
And then maybe we can have an actual dialogue scene between the Waif and Arya where they can finally hash it out. But nope. Game of Thrones is all about action now. After defeating the Waif, Arya confronts Jacken, and a really confusing encounter happens. Since Arya killed the Waif, Jacken says that she is now no one. Like, what are you talking about? She reverted back to being Arya Stark and killed the Waif in self-defense. So how is Arya no one in this situation? Then when she has to say that she's Arya Stark for the now slow Jacken, he seems visually confused and shocked. Has he not known this whole time? What the fuck is happening? Then Jacken smiles and gives her a head nod, like everything is fine and lets her go? So has he admired her this whole time? This is all very conflicting. Because surely he would be upset if he thought Arya was truly no one and has overcome the waif, but now is suddenly leaving. I don't even know anymore. It just seems like David and Dan want to get Arya out of Braavos as fast as possible to get to the twins in order to kill Walder Frey. Which she does manage to get there in one episode by the way. So fast travel is now active. I think it's time for our daily dose of cock jokes. With everyone's favorite character, Euron Greyjoy. This whole scene has the temperament of a comment thread in Wall Street Bets. All of Euron's counter arguments are honestly brain dead, and involve him spouting cock jokes, saying he'll do whatever Yara said, but better. I will build the largest fleet the world has ever seen. Except I'm the one who's going to build the Iron Fleet. And he openly admitted to killing Balon Greyjoy, which apparently not a single person there was loyal to him, despite people gasping and seeming upset that he died. Then after losing one of the cringiest debates, Yara and Theon casually steal the Iron Fleet, and at this point, I assume people are allergic to guarding ships. Next, the Bran Conundrum. It feels like David and Dan paused Bran at the end of Season 4, and hit resume when Season 6 began. What has he been doing throughout the entirety of Season 5? We are left to assume that they've been doing nothing but viewing random events in the past. Instead of giving us development for Bran in which he learns lessons tied to his power, we end up just getting glorified flashbacks. Why are we even here, the Three-Eyed Raven? I don't know, just because. What is the goal? To watch every past major event? And if that's the case, why would that even matter because once Bran becomes a Three-Eyed Raven, he can just any percent speedrun on learning all the information in the world. It would have been much better to have a gradual decline for Bran into becoming a husk of a human that transforms into the Three-Eyed Raven over the course of Season 5 and 6 who expands his knowledge of working into other creatures, or even humans, and also learns how to properly manipulate time. The time travel reveal was outstanding, but since David and Dan decided to do nothing with it in the later seasons, the whole reveal and skill set was rendered pointless. Because of the terrible direction of decreasing the presence of magic in the later seasons, Bran ends up getting shafted as a result. I hate to interrupt my Bran tangent, but hey, the Hound is alive. This mostly seems like a retcon given how he fell off a cliff, got his head bashed six times, and his nuts got reduced to jelly. It's plausible for him to survive if he received immediate attention, but Brother Ray supposedly found him while while after he fell. And one thing that doesn't add up is Brother Ray finding the hound in the first place. Because firstly, why is this random dude out in the middle of nowhere in the mountains? And secondly, he said he had a wagon with him, and the terrain the hound fell on is definitely not suitable for a wagon. So did this guy randomly wander really far off the road and happen to have stumbled upon the hound? I don't know, this whole situation comes across as blatantly forced to bring Sindor back into the story, just to get to the endpoint of Clegane Bull. Which is not a bad ending for his character by any means, but the process of bringing him back is undeniably sloppy and raises a lot of questions. To throw in a quick point, since quite a bit of screen time takes place during the Siege of Riverrun, the way David and Dan deal with Bran and Tully, aka the Blackfish, is so upsetting. Because we have this big buildup of the Blackfish refusing to leave his home and is willing to fight anyone in his way, to then just suddenly dying off screen when the Lannisters breach the gates? Did David and Dan think he was an unimportant character? It comes across as odd because David and Dan have injected so much action in the later seasons that you'd think they would give us a cool action send-off for this badass character, but they couldn't be bothered. Going back to Tyrion, his peace plan with the Masters works briefly and has a celebration scene with Grey Worm and Missandei. And for the third time this season, David and Dan go for the dialogue approach of comedy. Wouldn't it be funny if Grey Worm and Missandei tried wine? Look at Grey Worm's funny face when sniffing the wine! 
and then the rest of the scene consists of them telling jokes to each other. At this point in Game of Thrones, any dialogue scene that doesn't contain plot development is basically filler content, since David and Dan have a remarkable talent of not knowing how to develop characters with dialogue. Luckily though, this scene is halted by the Masters showing up with their ships and a plan to assault Marine, Which is another entirely different issue. The Masters have had great success in disrupting the health of Marine by funding the Sons of the Harpy to cause chaos within the city. At the beginning of Season 6, we see that Marine is basically a ghost town due to the amount of fear the Sons of the Harpy have spread throughout the city. And since that was such a big issue for Daenerys' side, Tyrion desperately tries to strike a peace bargain with the Masters. Which obviously shows to the Masters that their plan is working really well. So why not keep supporting the Sons of the Harpy and claim that they've gone rogue? Because there's no way that the Masters can beat Daenerys' army. For ground combat alone, she has the Unsullied, Second Sons, and the Dothraki. For the Sons of the Harpy, they are just normal people and aren't good at fighting, and their strength derives from surprise attacks and overwhelming their enemies with guerrilla fighting tactics. So using them in an all-out attack is idiotic, and they get wiped out for it. And then for the Sea Assault, their plan completely hinges on the fact that Viserion and Rhaegal won't be able to attack their ships. I assume their only intel on the dragons is that they're locked away under the pyramid, but logically from their perspective, they would be let out to attack the ships. And to add, they weren't even let out and instead bursted out by themselves, so I don't know why Viserion and Rhaegal willingly stayed down in the dungeons, or even knew how Daenerys returned. In general though, this all-out attack from the Masters is very illogical. It seems like David and Dan are trying to quickly wrap up that plotline so Daenerys could go to Westeros by the end of the season. If the Masters know that her goal is to go to Westeros, then it would make sense for them to wait until she leaves to then attack Marine if they really wanted to. But that would make too much sense. Queen Daenerys won't stay in Marine forever. The path takes her westward. For Tyrion's quote-unquote great work in Marine, Daenerys decides to make Tyrion her hand. And this development is pretty shocking given that she hasn't spent that much time with Tyrion since she's been taking care of the Dothraki, and while Tyrion was in control, he made a lot of mistakes. Tyrion at this point from Daenerys' perspective hasn't really done anything to earn the title, and she doesn't even know him that well. So again, this feels like another rushed development. And now it's time for the Battle of the Bastards. I've openly critiqued this battle multiple times in past videos, but since this is a devoid logic video for Season 6, let's get into it. Before the battle even starts, Jon and Sansa have a heated argument where Sansa declares that they obviously need more men. Earlier, I would have told you not to attack Winterfell until we had a larger force, or is that obvious When too? will we have a larger force? It's pretty wild that Sansa doesn't decide to relay the information to Jon that she has allies with Littlefinger and has access to the Vale. With the Vale alone, they could easily beat Ramsay's army on top of having the Wildlings and other northern houses supporting them. Also, if they announced that they had the support of the Vale in their pitch to other northern houses, then they probably would have helped given that they were the winning side. But instead, Sansa complains and bickers towards Jon Snow that he needs to be doing a better job when she's single-handedly handicapping the entire battle. David and Dan completely butcher the intellect of Sansa by not telling Jon about the Veil, vale, so that they can have an engaging underdog conflict of Jon trying to defeat Ramsay with a smaller army. If they were to attack with the Veil vale in the beginning, then the potential for losses would be drastically reduced. For instance, if the story was more realistic, Jon Snow would have died considering that he survived a cavalry charge, eight arrow storms, being swarmed by enemies, and being trampled by his own men. The plot armor on display is crazy. Like, yes, the action looks magnificent and the cinematography is gorgeous, but nothing here makes sense. From the contrived scenario of actively handicapping yourself to make things more interesting, the plot armor, and the deus ex machina ending of the veil arriving just in time to save everyone makes this scene absurdly stupid. But is the action cool? Yes, it is, and it's absolutely fine if you enjoy it. After the battle, Jon and Sansa have a confrontation in which they say that they need to trust each other more. I don't know why that's even an issue in the first place before the battle because Jon has never been untrustworthy towards Sansa, but whatever. And that's not even the biggest issue because Jon thinks Sansa and says this. You're the Lady of Winterfell. You deserve it. We're standing here because of you. The battle was lost until the Knights of the Vale rode in. They came because of you. On a technicality, yes that's true, but... At the same time, she almost let Jon and his entire army die. Imagine having the best winning hand and almost losing it. David and Dan just chalk up almost every screw up as stupid incompetence that comes and goes for our characters and there are no lasting consequences for Sansa making this massive mistake. 
Once Littlefinger is done stalking Sansa from behind the trees, he comes out and says he wants the Iron Throne with her by his side. At this point in the story, I don't know why Sansa doesn't expose Littlefinger for killing Lysa Aaron and to have him killed. I know that he just helped Sansa by bringing in the veil, but that was the only thing Sansa needed him for, and he has proven to Sansa that he acts in his own self-interest and will likely betray him again. Hell, she even calls him out on that. You've declared for other houses before Lord Baelish. It's never stopped you from serving yourself. Only a fool would trust Littlefinger. And if one of you were planning to harm the other in any way, wouldn't she be on a bound to intercede? So why is she letting him meander around Winterfell and scheme for the entirety of Season 7? Littlefinger handing Sansa over to the Boltons in Season 5 is an unforgivable act that has severely traumatized her, and by even entertaining the notion of listening to Littlefinger again is incomprehensible. For the last big scene, there's the Great Sept Explosion. The main issue I have with it is that there's no lasting impact, and no one cares that Cersei deleted a whole religion. However, I've talked about that numerous times, and I briefly went over it in the last Avoid a Logic video. Then for the rest of the finale, I already touched on flawed scenes like Jon and Sansa's conversation, Tyrion becoming Hand, and Littlefinger mouth-breathing on Sansa. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and let me know in the comments if I miss any glaring flaws in Season 6.